Before this video begins in earnest, I think it is only fair to mention comparative religion. Many of us are aware that other theologies have resurrection stories and virgin birth stories. Many of them are contemporary or older than the stories in Christianity, and it is certain that the same pattern that is so important to Christianity was available and known to ancient people. However, up until this point, no good explanation has been given as to why Christianity would adopt such a pattern. Today, I hope to answer that question. Many of you may recall the previous work I did on the book of Revelation. In that series, many of the chapters ended up correlating to historical events. The book of Revelation was written for the purposes of divination, essentially turning historical events into allegories, which would encourage the reader to interpret the stories and find mysterious meanings. Today, we'll talk about the most important chapter in the book of Revelation, and as we'll find out later, this is probably the most important chapter in all of Christianity. Revelation 6 was written as early as 59 CE. It describes an eclipse that passed through this area on April 30th, 59 CE. Since I've done several videos on the subject, I'll link those below. For this video, the historical part is not so significant. What is important is the patterns that can be detected from this text. This is the full breakdown of Revelation 6. As you may recall, the four horses were planets, the objects were constellations, and the rest of the allegories were devoted to king eras. For a very long time, I thought these were unimportant. However, if you focus on the era of Tiberius, a very interesting pattern emerges. Notice that along with the era of Tiberius, the constellation reference is the scales. These scales likely signify judgment. The previous constellation is the sword. The sword is spoken of only in a few texts. Revelation 1.16 states, In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. Revelation 2.16 states, Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Hebrews 4.12 states, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. The double-edged sword represents the word. Jesus doesn't literally have a sword coming out of his mouth. The sword is simply a metaphorical representation of the Logos, God's word. In the fourth seal, the Hyades cluster was converted into Hades. For our purposes, Hades will remain. Revelation 6, 8 states, Its writer was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. The usage of death here is not typical for the rest of the seals, and we will extract that into our pattern. At this time, I'd like to mention the last two seals. Seal 5 only talks about the souls under the altar. These are dead people in hell. Seal 6 talks about a commotion. This is the eclipse itself. And finally, in chapter 7, we have the raising of the 144,000. These are the same souls under the altar from the fifth seal. Now that we have our pattern, let's see what it says. The Logos was judged in the era of Tiberius. It died, went to hell. There was a pause where the souls of the dead were complaining. There was darkness, and then 144,000 were brought out of hell. The first part of the pattern should be familiar. This is essentially what the Gospel of John says, and it should be noted that of all texts, John is the only one that emphasizes the Logos. The second part of this pattern may not be so familiar. Only one text states that Jesus went to hell after he died and brought all the souls out of hell. That would be the Gospel of Nicodemus. Based on this pattern, it can be concluded that the resurrection of Jesus was not known until after 59 CE. It was divined sometime after that point and probably later than the destruction of the temple in 70. The earliest theology appears to be a Logos theology. It can also be concluded that since Paul mentions resurrection nine times in the authentic letters, that Paul clearly was not writing before 59 CE, that the so-called Council of Jerusalem, the meeting between Peter and Paul around 50 CE, never happened, and that Acts of the Apostles is pure fiction. Even the twelve apostles themselves could not have been known before the story of the resurrection, and the works of Irenaeus are largely fictional when it comes to describing his own theology. His lineage back to Peter and Paul is mythology. The first theology of Christianity appears to be Johannine. This would include much of the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Nicodemus. This would also include the bulk of the text of the Acts of Pilate, 
The date that this theology came into existence is unknown, but ranges between 70 and 100 CE. Hi YouTube. I thought I'd uh, stop by and try to answer some questions before I get asked them. Uh, first, what I am spe saying very specifically is that the life, um, trial, death, resurrection of Jesus was all divined from Revelation 6. Um, if you extrapolate just a little bit further than I did in this video, you find that um, what was divined was the logos not jesus but the logos in other words this theology believed that the logos appeared and they're not the only one um, we could talk about the canites or the sethians the canites believed that cain was the logos the sethians believed that seth was the logos all of these theologies, including probably uh, the theology of John the Baptist, the Simonians, the theology of Dositheus, they all thought that the Logos appeared. And very likely, all of them had this text. It's just, just so happens that the Christian version, they named him Jesus. That's basically it. Um, and if you extrapolate a little bit further, you'll remember that in Revelation 12, I I pulled part of the birth story out of the Eclipse 71. Well, in Revelation 6, going back just a little further, uh, the Logos appears in the era of Augustus. Now, the first theologies of Christianity appear to not pay attention to that. They seem to believe that the Logos simply poofed into existence sometime in the era of Tiberius, died, went to hell, and resurrected. Uh, in that era. It's uh, just a little bit later that we have the Eclipse of 71 and that being divined um, added to this idea that the Logos could be born um, and therefore it was born in the era of Augustus rather than Tiberius. So <clears throat> the entire story really of Jesus appears to have been divined from Revelation. And this is very, very problematic for the Twelve Apostles. Very problematic, because the Twelve Apostles are so important to the story. But if the story is divined, then the Twelve Apostles very likely didn't exist. They're probably just um, there for, I don't know, storytelling, at least originally. But the uh, meeting between Peter and Paul in 50 could not possibly have happened. It's impossible. And the same thing can be said about Paul's writings. They cannot happen before 59 because he talks about things that were divined from eclipses in the first century. So this text really flips the the Catholic idea of how their theology started. It flips it on its head. Uh, Catholicism was not about some guy named Jesus who died and resurrected and said, hey, Peter, create the Catholic Church. And then he went and created the Catholic Church and for some reason decided to go to Rome, which was just brilliant on his part, to get executed for no apparent reason. You know, it the absurdity, the absolute absurdity of the Catholic um, history should be kind of self-evident. You know, right after Peter go, Paul goes up there too. He's like, what the hell? Just go ahead and kill me. Yeah. You know, it didn't happen that way. These are all stories. And most of them were written in the second century. But uh, that's all I'm going to give you today. I'll probably talk more about Revelation 6 later. Thanks a lot, folks. Bye.